Welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Become a member today by clicking the join button below this video or on our YouTube channel page. Channel members get access to exclusive perks including two weekly members-only videos with limited ads, monthly members-only giveaways with exclusive Bigfoot Case Files merchandise, and more. For a full list of all channel member perks, please see the membership tab on our channel page. And as always, thank you all for your support. Allegheny County, Pennsylvania On March 4, 2012, at approximately 8.30 a.m., I had a visual sighting. It was cold, snowy, a bit overcast, and a bit windy, and approximately 28 to 30 degrees outside. I was sitting in my mother's apartment on the fourth floor watching TV, and I happened to look out the window, and I counted 15 full-grown turkeys moving down the hill adjacent to her apartment building. They were not running, but they were not taking their time either. I would like to say at this moment, it's not unusual to see two or three turkeys at a time coming down the hill, but 15 were out of the ordinary. A short time later, three deer came walking down the hill in the same manner as the turkeys. Not exactly running, but not walking either. I did not think anything unusual was going on, but I was surprised at the number of turkeys at one time. I asked my mother who lived there for several years if she had seen that many at one time, and she said no. My mother, my wife, my son and I watched the turkeys walk across the parking lot and out of sight down by the church. I didn't summon my family to see the deer, as three deer were no big deal. Less than five minutes after the turkey and deer left the area, I was still sitting in my mother's room watching TV when I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye, and I looked and I saw a very large, very hairy animal that is unknown to me near the top of the hill. The animal was on all fours and near the top of a hill and took about three strides before it got to the top, stood up and made a right and ran on two feet into the forest part of the field. It did not stand fully erect, but like two thirds erect. The total time I had eyes on the creature was approximately seven seconds. Since that day, I've tried to figure out in my mind what it could have been, and I have no answer. Honestly, the best I can say is that it looked like a gorilla. Please understand that when I was younger, I was a hunter. I did a lot of deer hunting and bear hunting in the Allegheny Mountains, and seen a lot of animals, but never seen anything like this. I was a police officer for over 20 years, and have been trained in observing my surroundings and articulating reports. South Park is not far from my mother's apartment building and is full of wildlife and trees. In my mind, I feel as though the creature was responsible for chasing the turkey and deer out of the woods. May have been very hungry and chased them too far, not realizing that it had made its way into a populated area. And when I saw it, it was trying to get back to the forest. The subject was a bit taller than six feet and approximately 250 to 300 pounds with a massive upper body build. It was covered in dark brown hair, approximately four to six inches long, but not around the upper face. The witness could see that the skin was dark tan where it was more visible. The witness had the idea that the subject was younger and perhaps new to the area. The distance from the window to the subject was approximately 150 feet, with the window being only slightly above the level of the subject. The area of the sighting is in the middle of the southern suburbs of Pittsburgh, near a county park with suitable forage and cover for a single, perhaps transient, animal. My name is Amanda and I live in Plum, Pennsylvania. On July 23, 2006, I was sitting outside talking to my boyfriend of nine months, Tommy. I heard something moving in the woods beside our house but disregarded it as a wolf or a bear or something like that. I continued talking to Tommy for about another 20 minutes when I smelled something strange and happened to look up and see a figure in the middle of our field that appeared to be about eight or nine feet tall. It was very large and covered in dark brown to black hair from head to foot. Its face was part human, part something else. I jumped up in fear, ran into my house and immediately locked the doors and shut the blinds. My family was wondering what was wrong with me, and they all said I was pale as a ghost. 
My mum went out and shone a flashlight around. We saw nothing else that night. The next morning, my cousin and I woke up and went outside to investigate. We found flattened grass and three clearings in the woods and tracks that led deep into the woods. We were going to go into the woods, but both of us were too frightened by what we had already found to venture off into the woods. It was the scariest moment of my entire life. It was about 4.30 a.m. in November 2004, and I had just settled into my tree stand for a day of hunting. It was extremely quiet, which was the first thing that I noticed. It was going on about 5 o'clock when I heard what sounded like a log being hit with another log. I brushed it off as something going on up at the new construction site on top of the hill. About 5.20 a.m., I heard something walking back and to my left toward the top of the hill I was sitting on. I was about a quarter of the way up the hill, and this was near the top where I heard it. I knew the walking was bipedal, and at this point in time, I got very angry about somebody trespassing and ruining my day of deer hunting. As the noise got closer, the sun was just up enough I could skyline this huge man walking across the top of the ridge. I looked at him through my binos, and well, it wasn't a man. I know this Bigfoot had to be seven and a half feet tall and at least 650 pounds. He was dark brown or black in color, unable to tell exactly due to the lighting issues. I wasn't able to make out facial features, but his hair was maybe two inches long and his hands were definitely below knee level. I put my binos down and it was then he must have noticed something and within three strides, he disappeared into the grapevine thicket. The entire actual sighting lasted maybe 15 seconds. In the fall of 1971, a friend and I were sitting down on a pipeline right away within the boundaries of Hampton Township. We heard a noise that sounded like something that a large bird would make. A little while later, we heard something that sounded like someone knocking on a tree with a piece of wood or something. These sounds continued alternating off and on for about 20 minutes or so. I remember that my friend and I were talking about how the sounds were a little strange and getting louder. At one point, I realized that the sounds were coming from a point very close to us, and they seemed to be coming from the same place, so we stood up to see if we could see anything. It was then that we saw the animal. It looked at us, we looked at it, and we all took off running. Before running, I noticed that what I was looking at was about seven feet tall, relatively the same proportions as a normal human, except for longer arms and it was covered with shaggy, two to four inch long gray hair. The face was not clear to me. I have slight astigmatism, and I could not make out the features at the distance of about 20 to 30 yards. The animal crashed through the woods as it ran away, just breaking down everything in its way. I kept looking back as I ran, and it just seemed to be going in a straight path up the hill towards Sample Road. Some years later, I visited a wax museum in Niagara Falls, and at the end of the exhibit was somebody's idea of a Bigfoot. It looked very much like the one that I saw, except for the facial features. This one had big pointy teeth and looked pretty angry. I could not clearly see the face of the one I saw, but I don't think it had big pointy teeth and an angry expression. I used to go to this area to pick blueberries and gooseberries. I thought that maybe the Bigfoot was there for that reason. After this incident, I camped out near the location of the sighting for one night, but did not see or hear the animal. There were several sightings in the area by my family members and some friends. The animal was heard many times as well, without being seen. Footprints were seen, my parents made plaster casts of footprints, and researchers were called in and they interviewed my parents. The interviewers seemed to be trying to connect the Bigfoot sightings with UFO sightings in the area. This was all in the 70s and 80s. I don't know the specifics of any recent sightings in the area besides the one on Wildwood Sample Road. However, I have heard that sightings in the area are still not rare, which is about one and a half to two miles from my sighting, I think. It was summer in the mid-80s. Sorry, I can't be more specific. 
some friends and I had taken to exploring the woods that surrounded our town, Dravisburg. We were constantly in the woods for one reason or another. On this particular morning, I think it was around nine o'clock, only one of my friends was able to accompany me into the woods. We followed our normal trail to the rim of Curry Hollow, which was about 400 yards into the woods. We strung some ropes and went down the incline. It was steep enough that the ropes were necessary. When we got to the floor of the hollow, we started walking through a section of woods that we hadn't checked out yet. Mostly, we were just wandering and seeing what was in the area. At that time of my life, I had started developing an interest in the outdoors and wildlife. So whenever we were in the woods, I tried to make sure we were quiet enough not to scare away any animals. We all enjoyed trying to track the different species in the area. In our wanderings, we found raccoon dens, snake and bird nests, and even tracked a few deer through the trees and brush. So when we saw the animal stand up in front of us, we knew instantly that this was something different. We were coming up on a deadfall that had been covered over with vines and surrounded by small saplings since it had fallen. We started to go around the fallen tree and had made it to the base when we both spotted a humped shape covered with brown hair or fur. The shape was about 10 feet in front of us and was close to a tangle of vines and brush. We both froze and just stared. We had both been told that though they were rare in the area, some people had seen bear in and around these woods. And that's what we thought this was. And we knew we were too close. Thinking it might be injured since it was so still, I decided we should go home and let my father, a local cop, know about it. I glanced to my friend and motioned to him that we should go back the way we came. We had just started to turn when the shape stood up and took off running. When it stood, we saw that it was at least two feet taller than us. At the time, we were both around five and a half feet tall. When it started running was when I got scared. It was on two legs. It cleared a good 20 yards through the brush in what seemed like a split second. We instantly took off the other way and didn't stop until we made it up the rope and out of the woods. We didn't discuss it at the time. Later that week, we talked and told some friends, and a few days later, we went back to the area with three more people. We found the tangle of brush the figure was behind and saw a large clear space, the size of which a small family of deer would have made, but there were no tracks, neither footprints or hoof prints. The ground cover was a thick mat of leaves over the entire area. We noticed nothing else out of the ordinary. At that time, I had seen bears in the zoo and on nature programs, and had seen them stand up on two legs. This was not a bear. It moved too fast and did it upright, and it certainly wasn't a deer or a big dog or anything else I'd ever seen outside of a movie. When the figure stood up, it was a good two feet taller than us, so that would put it at around seven and a half feet tall. It had its back to us, and I got a good perspective of its bulk. It was muscled, but not fat like a bear, and it had sloping shoulders. That was all I saw. I started running around that time. I read about a foul smell others have noticed during their encounters, but I noticed nothing like this. It did make a lot of noise as it ran, crashing through the brush and trees. It ran in the direction of the road which splits the hollow in half. The other side of the hollow has less steeply angled sides and would have been much easier to climb. Plus, there was more wooded area on that side of the hollow. I have never spoken to anyone else about this since that summer. I knew no one would believe me. The following encounter was emailed to Bigfoot Case Files by Eric. It occurred in 2004 near Mount St. Helens. This is his story. I was hanging out at certain spots in Washington and Oregon. One of the spots was west of Mount St. Helens at a parking place where you could walk to see a river and some woods. This place is just west of a convenience store right before you go further into the park and to the observation post near Mount St. Helens. So that road if you know the one I'm talking about. One time I was there, it felt creepy, and I saw a shadowy figure looking like a Bigfoot in a wooded area. It made some noise and broke some branches or twigs. It was a thick area. It appeared more in a natural form and was like seven or eight feet tall and disappeared like it was in another place or dimension. 
I had recently hurt my back and always saw spiritual stuff, but seemed to be more since I tweaked something in my spine. The feeling in the air was creepy and felt I should leave, so I left. It seemed like it was real, but not real. Weird, but it definitely happened. I came to the same area a few days later. I was standing in an open area between the road and the river, but some trees. All of a sudden, a Bigfoot appeared out of nowhere, like from a different dimension. It was huge, like a giant, not seven or eight feet, but the size of a medium-sized tree. It was walking toward me. I froze. I couldn't move. Right before it got to me, it disappeared into another dimension. I figure that when they appear in the natural, they are seven or eight feet tall, but when seen in another dimension, they are giants. I recently, in the last few months, heard that Fred Beck from the ape attacks of the 1920s said the same thing. I always said you won't get a picture of one or find a body because they are from another dimension. The next night, I had a vision or dream of a whole community of Bigfoots living in the Mount St. Helens area, but were in another dimension, all the size of giants. At that time, I was highly seeing spiritual things due to my back injury. I don't recommend looking for them. If you do happen to see one, I don't view it as a good thing. I don't think they are meant to be seen, and it means you are somewhere you are not supposed to be. I view all so-called Bigfoot sightings on film as being a man in a suit. Once again, you won't see them fully in this dimension. If seen in this dimension, they will be seven or eight feet tall and can disappear. The experience was very real and shook me for a few weeks. But who could I tell, and who would believe me? If you hear of stories or folklore of something in an area, it's most likely true. But once again, these creatures or folklores are multidimensional beings, so there won't be a body or capture on film. Fred Beck is the only other person I've heard say this. Joe Rogan also made mention of them being multidimensional. Thanks to Eric for sharing his experience. As Eric mentioned in his email, Fred Beck is the only other person I've heard say this. I'm going to tell you what happened to Fred as he wrote in his book, I Fought the Ape Men of Mount St. Helens, Washington. We've all heard about Ape Canyon and the attack on Fred Beck and his companions, but some of us haven't heard the entire story. The following is an excerpt from Beck's book, Chapter 3, Background Events. In the first chapter, I told about the attack, and now I want to go into the background and tell a little concerning our activities. They will be colorful, and from them emerge a spiritual and metaphysical understanding of the case. First of all, I hope this book does not discourage too much those interested souls who are looking and trying to solve the mystery of the abominable snowman. If someone captured one, I would have to swallow most of the contents of this book, for I'm about to make a bold statement. No one will ever capture one, and no one will ever kill one. In other words, present to the world a living one in a cage, or find a dead body of one to be examined by science. I know there are stories that some have been captured but got away, so they will always get away. I say this confident by the evidence of my experiences, things that I have not before revealed to the public, and I also say it from the knowledge gained on the subject later. In this book, I will reveal thoroughly what I know them to be. First of all, I will say that they are not entirely of the world. I know the reaction we experienced as these beings attacked our cabin impressed many with the concept of great ape-like men dwelling in the mountains. And I can say that we genuinely fought and were quite fearful, and we were glad to get out of the mountains. But I was, for one, always conscious that we were dealing with supernatural beings. And I know the other members of the party felt the same. The events leading up to the ape episode were filled with the psychic element. Since a young man, I had always been clairvoyant. When just a boy, I was in the pasture playing with my bean shooter. I had bought it with some long-earned coins. It had a twisted wire handle. I had lost it, and as I was crying, a kindly woman came up to me and put her arms around me. I felt warm all over. Little boy, she said, don't cry. Go home. You will find your bean shooter there. I went home and found it, 
and as far as I knew then, it was the same one. But years later, I found the one I lost. It was weather-beaten, and the rubber was rotten. I would be sleeping on the hard benches of the Adventist church my folks used to attend, and I would have my head on a lady's lap. Only when I mentioned it to my folks, they said there was no one else there, and took it to be a boy's musings. As I grew older, I saw visions, and eventually I was holding spiritual meetings. After 1924, I spent many years in healing work. Our time spent in Mount St. Helens was a series of psychic experiences. The method we found our mind was psychic. I am mentioning these facts to help build a background of understanding in a case which has been wholly explained in a material sense. As I will explain the mysterious realities of the abominable snowmen, so must I show some of my inner experiences, for in my mind the two have always been closely connected together, and as I will show, these beings bear a direct association with the psychic realm. In 1922, we found the location of our mine. A spiritual being, a large Indian dressed in buckskin, appeared to us and talked to us. He was the picture of stateliness itself. He never told us his name, but we always called him the Great Spirit. He replied once, The Great Spirit is above me. We are all of the Great Spirit, if we listen when the Great Spirit talks. There was another spiritual being which appeared to us, more in the role of a comforting friend, and we learned her name. One of our party suggested later that we name our mine after her, and so the mining claim we later filed bore her last name. The big Indian told us there would be a white arrow go before us. Another man, who was not present during the attack in 1924, could see the arrow easily and clearly at all times, and I could see it nearly as well. So we started by the Lewis River, south of Mount St. Helens, and went up the Muddy River, and in all we followed the White Arrow four days. The going was slow, for in those days it was very rugged territory. Hank's temper was growing short as he climbed the hills. He had always been a believer of spiritual things, and afterwards he was a believer. But he lost his temper and cussed. He swore at the spirit leading us. His face was red, and we could not stop him. Just a wild goose chase, he exclaimed. They lied to us, and got us running all over the hills, and I want nothing more to do with them. He went on and on. Then, just when he had started to calm down, we all saw the arrow soar up high, change direction, and swoop down. We had to follow in the general direction before we could find it again. It hovered near the top of the north cliff of Ape Canyon. That was the site where we later blasted out our shaft. We got a little closer, and we all saw the image of a large door open, and the big Indian appeared in front of it. He spoke, Because you have cursed the spirit leading you, you will be shown where there is gold, but it is not given to you. With those words he disappeared. Then we saw the door slowly close. There was a huge lock and latch, but as the door shut, the lock did not latch. A closed door, but it was not locked. We just as well pack up and go home, one of the party said. And that is just the way our gold mine turned out. Closed, but not locked. We worked that mine for two years, and one essay showed well over $2,000 a ton. But as it turned out, what we had actually done was to cut the leaders. There's a pocket of gold in that cliff if someone is fortunate enough to find it. We gave up looking for it. The picture I'm trying to paint for you is a picture of manifestation. In this book, I have showed also some of our high manifestations, as we had many of a high nature the six years we spent in the Mount St. Helens area. Of course, the lower or grosser manifestations were in the appearing of these hairy creatures called abominable snowmen, also called hairy apes, Bigfoot, and Sasquatch, according to the region they are seen in. I believe they have always existed, although our encounter with them in 1924 was the first major report of anyone coming in contact with them. Other writings have documented the cases very well. I'd just like to show the reason for their appearances. For six years, all had been peaceful. We were simple men and hard-working men, and an aura of good or spiritual power surrounded us. We had seen the tracks, but the makers of them had left us alone. 
No one was really worried about the tracks as regarding any threat to our safety. But after one of us had lost his temper and denounced the spirit leading us as a liar, from that time on, a quiet apprehensiveness settled over us. We continued working our claim, but deep down we felt it would avail to no good end. We had bursts of enthusiasm, but no success. And yet we did have success, because we learned. Nothing can replace experience as a teacher. There are a couple of experiences which show some light or evidence on the psychic nature of abominable snowmen. The same thudding, hollow, thumping noise we heard at night preceding the attack, we also had heard in broad daylight, although not nearly so loud. One of our party was a little irritated with me. On our excursions, he usually led the way, and I followed a little behind the others. We kept hearing that sound, and occasionally he turned around and would say, What's that? After six or eight times of him doing this, and after a few general discussions about the noise, he quickly turned around one more time and eyed me and said, By golly, boys, it's not Fred making that noise after all. But he decided to give it a double check. He made an excuse and wandered away from camp. When he came back, he said, Now I'm certain it's none of us. I walked for half an hour, and everywhere I went, I heard it. Sounds like there's a hollow drum in the earth somewhere, and something is hitting it. There is no doubt in my mind that these beings were present and observing us, but they had not yet appeared in physical form. Another very striking experience which shows they cannot be natural beings with natural bodies. It was before we made our cabin, and we were staying in a tent then. The tent was below a little cone-shaped mountain called Pumi Butte. A little creek flowed nearby, and there was a moist sandbar about an acre in area. We would go there and wash our cooking utensils and bring our drinking water back. Early one morning, Hank came back to the tent. He was rather excited. He led us to the moist sandbar and took us almost to the center. There, in the center of the sandbar, were two huge tracks about four inches deep. There was not another track on that sandbar. There we were, standing in the middle of the sandbar, and not one of us could conceive any earthly thing taking steps 160 feet long. No human being could have made these tracks, Hank said, and there's only one way they could be made. Something dropped from the sky and went back up. There was no third step. This is certainly another indication of what I'm saying about manifestation. I have heard it said that many ages ago, the Rocky Mountain and Cascade Mountain ranges were a center of great civilization. I do think the mountain areas are extra sensitive to spiritual vibration usually of a higher order, but sometimes lower. We ourselves, being extra sensitive to spiritual vibration, probably had come into contact with the manifestation of these beings, easier than, perhaps, the average person would have. On the subject of snowmen, I'm not going to say masters told me this or that. It would perhaps look impressive, but I want to keep the record straight. Masters have appeared in our home and talked with us, but not once do I recall asking them anything on the subject. Since that day in 1924, I have went on and progressed and have learned much, and now I can look back and put the puzzle together from the reservoir of knowledge I have learned. In the true sense, everything in the material world is a manifestation. Ever since the time the first essence of consciousness formed from the great void we cannot describe, different planes or dimensions of beings were created or manifested. Occasionally, we of this dimension of space can be conscious of other beings of a different vibration and consciousness. The snowmen are from a lower plane. When the condition and vibration is set at a certain frequency, they can easily, for a time, appear in a very solid body. They are not animal spirits, but also lack the intelligence of a human consciousness. When reading of evolution, we have read many times conjecture about the missing link between man and the anthropoid ape. The snowmen are a missing link in consciousness, neither animal nor human. They are very close to our dimension, and yet are a part of one lower. Could they be the missing link man has been so long searching for? The human soul once dwelled in a spiritual body and eventually incarnated at the fall of man into bodies like we have now. The beings we call abominable snowmen were not of the necessary high development to incarnate in human form. 
they had not reached that scale of spiritual evolution. They are the easiest beings materialized as evidenced by the many reports of their appearances to more people in recent years. In fact, if the vibratory influence right for them is present, they can manifest without any human being present at all. This accounts for the many tracks being seen along the mountain ranges of the West Coast and Canada. When this age or cycle of life that we are in moves on eventually to a higher cycle and all life moves forward, these beings may stay and move up in consciousness in some other world in the far distant future. Perhaps the ape beings will toil the road of intelligence in that world which none of us can even imagine, and perhaps they too will lose nothing and gain by their experience. Most theories picture the snowmen as material beings hiding in caves and scampering over the mountains. The law of probability would be that eventually one would be found if their bodies were of physical construction only. If one claims only the physical laws to explain their existence, then we can use a material logic to prove or disprove the premise. If they are material life, definite material evidence would surely be found. What material evidence do we have? In my opinion, which I believe firmly to be true, only shows material entrances into this plane, followed by the supernatural exits back into their own realm. I and my companions have shot them, but could find no trace of them. If they were material life like we know it to be on this globe, one would die naturally or accidentally, and the remains be found. The easy way out for lots of people is to just consider it a wild tale. But too many people have seen them, and the evidence is piling up to definitely prove this. The same line of escapism of thought concerning phenomenal sightings of flying saucers is evident. A report recently showed five million Americans claim to have seen flying saucers. Material things usually make a big splash in the material world, and spiritual things often do not make a ripple there. Why? We can give proof of a phenomenon, but its nature is immersed in the spiritual and can only be explained by laws of the spiritual. But these happenings that seem strange to people is serving a very useful purpose. It is causing more people to think, and that is a path in the right direction. The abominable snowmen are just one small mystery among many. Some day more people will conceive that the greatest proportion of life is a mystery, and he will seek and find solutions to them, and then the mysteries will be unveiled in their pure forms, and from that unveiling man will find greater life.